Hi everyone, we're going to get into our next uh, section of Ephesians, chapter 6. Has anyone ever talked to you, or have you ever thought about, or heard the phrase, uh, spiritual warfare? Um, some people talk about it a lot. Uh, I grew up in an era, in my teens, where I was very fascinated with the thought of spiritual warfare. Um, there were books about it. I read lots. Um, I was really intrigued and, and definitely wanted to engage with the thinking around that. Today we're going to be looking at um, the encouragement from Paul to armor up. And that's what we're going to look at. Before we get into that, I just did want to mention the fact that um, you know this chapter that we're looking at is a flow on from... Um, the last half of this letter that Paul wrote, where he's talking about how we are to live according to this calling, this amazing calling that we have in Christ. At the end, he starts talking about, he, he speaks to wives, he speaks to husbands, he speaks to children, and then he, oh, and he speaks to fathers, then he speaks to slaves, and then he speaks to masters. It's a really big issue at the moment. Um, looking at the racial uh, tensions that have, have, I can't say arisen at the moment because they were present, just perhaps not as seen as they are now. Um, and with that appalling event in America um, with George Floyd, when I saw the, the clip of that when it first happened, I was just flicking through the news and I saw this thing and looked at it and I just felt sick. I just felt so sick. And it has brought to the surface this this outrage. It's I guess it's kind of like it's the volcano has has erupted. This outrage um, towards um, the the mistreatment of certain sectors of our society and I think about um, you know for myself here in Kyogle I have seen those photos as appalling photos of indigenous people in chains around the neck and uh, just the it's just horrendous And the thing that I like about what's what's happening at the moment, like is probably the wrong word, the thing that I am um, appreciative of about this present situation, I could be tempted to think about, you know, that photo from the past and think, wow, that was so bad and be so outraged by that, but think, I'm glad it's not like that anymore. The current situation is that it's brought to the surface the reality of racial tensions that exist now, not just things that have happened in the past. And it's so important that we address now um, and not just talk about the past. Talking about the past is important and, and recognising the, the uh, horrible things that have happened um, and, and even unfortunately like, terribly some things have happened in the name of God which is so far from God's heart and um, and so it's important that these things be be addressed now and and I'm glad that it's come to the forefront um, recognizing things need to change and it's not a simple matter it's not just a thing of um, like the, the protests are for the purpose of, I guess, bringing an awareness to everyone that this is not okay. But the healing of this situation is something that's quite complex in that being systemic racial, uh, uh, racism um, is something about a whole culture that needs re configuring and that's something that takes time and intentionality um, and I guess we're only just 
kind of at the start of really wanting to address it properly and and my hope is certainly that things um, move in the right direction so just bringing that up because here in chapter 6 it, it says it talks to slaves and it talks to masters and, and you can ask the question you know does that mean God is all for slavery why would he talk to slaves in the Bible if God isn't for slavery and um, and that's a fair question the reality is in other parts um, when Paul's writing he says there is no it, he's he's highlighting the reality that um, there should be no distinction in value for people he says there's no male or female so there should not be a, a, a value distinction between male and female or, or he says um, Jew or Gentile which was a big racial issue at the time um, or um, slave or free was some some of the those were some of the things that he mentioned in that verse in Galatians and he says it in, in Colossians as well in terms of what God thinks about people everyone is made in the image of God everyone has that equal value and needs to be respected needs to be um, honoured as a reflection of God's glory there's value in every single person no matter what no matter what background um, and that's that's God's heart in this particular situation Paul is speaking in a culture that had slaves and there were some slaves for example um, he writes a letter to a bloke called Philemon who had a slave Onesimus Onesimus is, um, gets away from Philemon and goes to Paul. Paul writes a letter, sends Onesimus back after some time with this letter that says, treat him as a brother, not as a slave. Um, and has some like fairly intense words there to him about the treatment that he should show this, this um, young man. But he's speaking in a culture that has slaves, and if slaves like Onesimus um, gives their lives to Jesus, this letter then is relevant to them because this, this letter is writing to Christians. So, writing to slaves, he says, okay, this is how you need to, you're in this situation. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't make a value comment on the particular situation, but he's saying, you're there, this is how you need to behave. And then he speaks to masters and says, do not threaten them or treat them harshly. Um, because God doesn't show favoritism. He says, you know, you're, uh, God sees you and, and your slave equally. So how you treat them is um, God's going to notice that. And so he, he's, he's speaking very clearly. He says, um, do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there is no favoritism with him. Um, and so that encouragement to masters in that situation from Paul is to say um, treat your slaves as people because there's no favoritism for God on God's behalf between a master and a slave it's not like he's okay about you mistreating him but expects the slave to treat the master well it's, no there's no favoritism you need to treat everyone well um, so I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up being in the chapter but our focus for today is we are going to look at this very well known passage of scripture um, and maybe you haven't heard this before maybe you're new to all of this and that's fine we're going to introduce you to it but maybe you have read this a lot of times and heard messages on it a lot of times and uh, and so we are going to look at it again and we're looking at verse in chapter 6 verses 10 to 12 particularly and then we'll go on to um, the armor as well but this is what it says finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can stand oops, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's the chunk I want to look at uh, now, and um, just pull apart a few things. Of course, there's a lot that you could talk about, but what I do want to look at firstly is Paul's wrapping up the letter, and it's kind of, it's nearly like this is a climatic um, piece of information that he wants to share with this word, finally. It's like he's worked his way through a lot of things to tell us, and, and particularly with um, how we are to live, like in this last uh, section of the, of the letter, as he's explaining how our life is meant to reflect this love we've received, he's concluding it, he's coming to this crescendo of, um, of uh, thought about how we are to live. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He's saying we need to do all of these things, we need to let go of this and put on this and stop doing that and do this instead. Um, to show what love really looks like in our lives. And, um, yeah, he, he comes to this place. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, the thing for me when I read that is like, how can you be strong in someone else's strength? He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Do, do you find that funny? I find it funny. Be strong in someone else's strength. I can't be strong in your strength. But this is uh, the reality of the kingdom of God. And this is, um, you know, you may have heard it said that the kingdom of God is like an upside down kingdom. And here's the thing. There's so many aspects of, of the kingdom that seem like it's... it's um, counterintuitive to how we would approach things um, and so one prime example of that is Jesus saying if you want to be great you need to be a servant uh, you need to serve others if you want to be great um, which is it, particularly at that time but still today because it's related to our hearts we find that hard to understand, that if you want to be great, you get low um, and serve people. But particularly, Jesus made a comment about the kingdom of heaven belonging to children and the need for us to um, take a lowly position of a child in order to be great in the kingdom of heaven. Um, and it makes me think this thought in terms of asking the question, about how you can be strong in someone else's strength. Well, the reality in God's kingdom is the more dependent you are on God, then the more empowered you are in God. So the more you are dependent on God, the more empowered you are. And, and um, it's kind of like you're giving space for God's power to come through. But you might ask me, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? I mean, it's a great thought, the idea of being dependent on God, but let's talk practically in everyday life. What does everyday life look like um, if we're being dependent on God? Well, here's a, here's a couple of things that I think show a dependence on God. First of all, foundationally, to a dependence on God is worship and adoration. If you're in a space where you are lifting up your gaze to see the greatness of God, it means that your view of yourself is getting in right perspective. So instead of puffing yourself up as being, yes, I'm great, yes, I'm great, yes, I'm great, and some self-help kind of vibes can really, you know, try and pump you up with just the message of how great you are. Well, let me say dependence on God can be very different to a pumping yourself up with yes I'm awesome, yes I'm awesome, yes I'm awesome worshipping God and adoring Him in His greatness going wow you're so big, you're so good so 
as soon as you're waking up or in those first moments of the day, choosing to say, okay, God, you're so big. You're so amazing. You're so powerful. You're so loving. You're so good. And I just want to, and the next step being, I just want to surrender to your love. I want to surrender to your power. I want to surrender to your wisdom in everything. And so that's the first step being worship and adoration. The next thing, and this doesn't have to be an actual order of ticking the boxes, but this is the kind of vibe of you worship God, you adore Him, and that should respond in your surrendering of yourself. Just go, oh, wow. I just, I lay myself down. I realize that I'm very small compared to you, so I want to listen to you. I want to receive everything you have for me today. And and then following on from that or flowing flowing out of that is a thankfulness, a thanksgiving for what it is that He has um already done for you in in salvation particularly that you are eternally secure you can be so thankful for that realizing I don't have to work really hard in order to impress God that hopefully my good will outweigh my bad and he'll let me into heaven we can be so thankful to go oh my security my eternal um, destination is set because of Christ and what he's done at the cross I'm forgiven, I'm, I'm, I'm set. And so having that thanksgiving, you can be thankful for so many things, but specifically turning your thankfulness not to some, not to some random thank the universe for whatever, but we're talking to a person, the person of God, the creator of all, actually being thankful and going, God, you are so good, thank you so much for all that you've done, all the blessings that I've received. Um, I am just so thankful for. Um, super important. And then moving on to like being dependent on God also then means requests because God is a loving Father. And you have those great examples that Jesus talked about um, when praying that we are to um, ask God for things. He gives, he gives the example of the um, persistent widow um, who was going to this judge and and pestering him for justice. And this particular judge was quite a nasty character, but because of her persistence and him being annoyed by her, he went, fine, fine, fine. I'll give you what you need. You can have your justice. Just leave me alone, please. And Jesus says, if that judge who's an, a nasty character will... Um, come through for justice for the for the widow. Um, how much more will God not come through um, for us? Him being a loving father, he gives the other example of. He says, you know, if a friend comes over in the middle of the night, knocks on your door, and says, "Give me some bread. I need some bread. I've got visitors that have arrived, and I've got nothing. Can you give me some bread?" And you're in bed, going, "No, go away." I'm in bed, go away, I don't want to wake everyone up. And he keeps knocking, no, I need the bread, I need the bread, I need the bread. Give me the bread, give me the bread, give me the bread. And then the, and then you're like, fine, fine. And the comment Jesus makes is, it's not because of the friendship that he gets up, but it's because of the audacity of this neighbour in asking continually um, in an annoying way. And then says, so with a loving father from heaven, ask and you'll receive. A dependence on God includes requests, includes asking God for things. We don't understand how to get through life on our own and we need the wisdom of God. We need the provision of God. We need miracles. We need we need lots of things. And so um, asking God is a great way to show um, a dependence on Him. And then, not only that, but then there's also act, acting out in faith, recognizing. There's one scripture in James where it talks about um, uh, if you don't have wisdom, if you lack wisdom, ask God. It's in James chapter 1. Ask, and then believe that you've received it. And so, you know, you're asking God for wisdom, and then going, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and expect that God is actually going to come through and this is what dependence on him is is you you've 
you've worshipped him, you've surrendered afresh, you're thankful, you've asked for something and then you act out in faith knowing that he's uh, promised to come through in different things provided that faith is not based on presumption but rather on, on revelation. So this is how we show dependence on God um, in everyday life. Super important. And that dependence on God is how we are strong in the Lord. As that, that verse says, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. It's a dependence. Become more and more dependent on God. Um, and in doing that, that dependence, you are strengthened because you see Him come through. You recognize His greatness. And your faith grows. And this is, this is how it all works. So that's how you, in my opinion, um, how you are strong in the Lord. By doing those things. The next part, I'm going to skip over verse 11. I'm going to come back to that. But verse 12, I just want to um, point out this. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I think this is an important element to our Christian faith, is understanding um, the the nature of our opposition. Um, I was reading a book, or I am reading a book from Ravi Zacharias. In that book, he he talks about a conversation that he has with this um, very scary and powerful terrorist, known terrorist in the world very high up in his scene um, and they get allowed to have this conversation he's he's a, an Indian uh, Ravi Zacharias is an um, Indian Canadian or he passed away about a month ago but he um, he travels all over the world he traveled all over the world teaching apologetics which is which is um, apologia a, a um, Greek word means answers, and, and so it's answers to, to that people have um, for questions people ask about Christianity. And so, very smart guy, and um, very well uh, read, and understands a lot. Anyway, he gets invited to this space with this terrorist, and the conversation is had where there's a recognition of a difference um, between Islam and Christianity and in Christianity there's a separation between a person's belief and the person so you can disagree with a belief but still value the person and love the person respect the person, honour the person um, fully but as this particular terrorist indicated there is no separation from belief and person um, the idea is that belief is is so ingrained in the person you can't separate the two so if there's if the belief is bad the person is bad and needs to die that was this terrorists um, and he made a some kind of joke about how um, he would quite willingly get out his gun and kill Ravi Zacharias in that moment because of the disagreement there on belief see what Paul is saying here is that our struggle, there is a struggle. There's, a, there's a, a wrestling in our Christian walk to be able to uh, live out our faith. But the wrestle is not with physical um, people. It's, it's in a, um, a realm that it is unseen. And so he's talking about, and it's not to, you know, he says against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms he's not talking about different layers or different roles really he's just kind of um, it's it's more or less he's he's just using similar terms to express um, one kind of thought Can't, unless my English um, grammar understanding is not right which is quite possible um, it's a it's a literary device called apposition 
where it's it's saying the same kind of thing in parallel but the the point of it all is that it's saying that the the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms as we've looked at uh, previously the heavenly realms don't just mean what we think of as heaven the place where God resides on his throne in all of his glory um, it's it doesn't this is the only book that refers to this term heavenly realms um, and it's um, it's speaking of this dimension that is unseen and it's where spiritual forces or spiritual um, powers spiritual beings exist and we don't see it with our with our uh, physical eyes unless God opens them to see which some people have um, but the point of it all is that we have an enemy there is a spiritual force of darkness that is actually it's set on bringing us down and destroying us if it can Jesus made the comment in John 10:10 10, 10, that the thief comes to steal kill and destroy he has this mission to um, undermine every good thing that God is doing or wants to do um, or has done and um, he's he's bent on that and so there is this this enemy at work and so Paul this is why we have to armor up because there is an enemy but I guess the question is when we think of the fact that we have an enemy is he defeated or not is the enemy defeated or not if he is why are we still fighting so I just wanted to kind of explain or give my answer to that anyway and, and hopefully it's adequate if anyone's asking that question about did Jesus defeat Satan at the cross if he did why are we still fighting why are we still in in a war why is there still a struggle that's it's not a struggle against flesh and blood it's not a struggle against people it's a struggle against something spiritual why so here's here's my thoughts on that in the very beginning when God created everything he created created the heavens and the earth he, he at the pinnacle of his creation he created humanity and he said be fruitful and increase in number in Genesis 1 28 fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish and the birds and every over every living creature he he gave the instruction to rule under his rule and you see this this um, passing down of authority God over everything passes authority to humanity to uh, to rule over the earth and everything in it and it's meant to be good and when you keep that that chain of, of authority um, it's life-giving that's the idea uh, then we get the story where um, Satan steps in and undermines what God is trying to do or what he has done and brings doubt to um, Adam and Eve doubting God's goodness and so cuts off that flow and death is introduced at that point but as it tells us in Ephesians 2 2 as we we read it a number of weeks ago the ruler of the kingdom of air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient that's it's referring to Satan there and so when humanity has broken that relationship with God um, they still have authority over the earth but now there's another ruler over them because they submitted to Satan humanity submitted to Satan and so now that spirit is at work in those who are disobedient to God those who have rejected God are still under the the ruling power of Satan and so that's um, part of why the whole or it is the reason why the whole of the world is suffering um, 
in all sorts of ways. It's because that that flow of authority that's meant to go from God to hum, humanity to the world was broken, and instead of trusting God, there was a there was a deception that came, a manipulation that came, and um, and now Satan has this this rulership. But then that's, that's not where the story ends, as we know in Ephesians 1, 20 to 21. It says, He raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. The thing I love about this, Paul's writing to a mob who there's lots of um, magic, dark arts, witchcraft going on. And in those scenes, different names of spirits are invoked in order to, uh, you know, uh, cast a spell or accomplish something. Um, so Paul's writing to people who have this kind of uh, way of viewing the world and says that Jesus has the name um, it's far above every name that is invoked. I love that. He's making a point that's saying no matter what spirit um, you know, however powerful the spirit may be the name of Jesus is above every other name that could ever be invoked. Um, and so what we get is because Christ is the, you know, there's that um, theological term hypostasis or the hypostatic union, that's this idea of Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. It's not half God and half man, not not a hybrid, it's a, it's a, a oneness of his he is God, and he was fully human at the same time in this hypostatic union or hypostasis. And so the thing about that, the re one reason why that's really important is that Jesus was fully human. So when he then walked through life in innocence, dies in our place to, to um, take out the punishment that we deserve, the wrath that we deserved, as it tells us in, in Ephesians 2. He took that wrath upon himself in his innocence, um, which means he, he's the only one who could actually die for humanity because he's the only one who was innocent, um, which means that he wouldn't be dying for his own sin. So he wasn't dying for his own sin, he was dying for the sin of the whole world. But in doing that, um, and then when he stepped out of the grave, as a human, he has conquered um, the rulership of Satan in death. I hope you're following what I'm saying. So he, he, as a human, he came as a human. Satan is kind of ruling over humanity and, and therefore over the world. Um, but when Jesus breaks through the rulership of Satan through defeating death, then all of a sudden we've got this um, representation of humanity that has restored relationship with God flowing uh, the way that it's meant to. And so then when we become a new creation, when we surrender to Jesus, we become one with Jesus. We become, as it tells us in, in Ephesians 2 again, there's this new humanity that is formed, um, which is amazing. And so... What we see then is that Christ defeated death, Christ reigns supreme, and now Satan has an expiry date. So he is still at work, but he has an expiry date. There is going to be a time where God takes Satan, throws him into hell, is what we read in um, Revelation. Hell is not Satan's playground or his fun. No, Satan is going to be the one who suffers the most in hell. Hell is something that exists according to scripture. Um, and Satan is going to be the most suffering of all. And so, what this means in terms of being defeated or not, he is defeated. Jesus defeated death, which means he is the name above every name, every other name that could ever be invoked. Jesus trumps. 
So yes, his his rulership over the world, his his tyranny over the world has been broken, and now there's a time limit on um, on when on how how much space that he has to work. Now you might be asking the question, well, why why has he got any time? There is time because God wants the message of His grace to get to every people group in the world. And so part of the issue is us as Christians, how long are we going to take to actually take this um, this commission seriously and go into all the world, making disciples of all nations. It's what Jesus told us to do. The longer we take, the longer it will be for Satan to do stuff. That's just the reality. So Satan has a time limit. But God is holding off until everyone, every people group, get an opportunity to hear the message of Jesus. Um, which is why missionary efforts are so important. Um, so, yes, he is defeated. And it's all set that he's going to suffer for all eternity. And there is this, there is this uh, time limit on his efforts now. Because he is still at work in those who are disobedient, as we just read. Those who reject God, he is still at work in. Um, and so, yes, we do have an enemy. And he is trying to destroy, he's trying to steal, kill and destroy. So the question is, how do we fight him? As I said earlier, I, in my teen years I read lots of books. Some fiction, um, some fiction by... Frank E. Peretti um, about the, 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 the war between angels and demons um, which certainly drew me into the, the thing but later on, a number of years later um, I read some books by C. Peter Wagner he did this series of books on prayer the importance of prayer but there was a big emphasis on, on spiritual warfare in this one particular book was very intense about you know spiritual mapping they talk they called it which isn't in the Bible by the way it's not that it's evil what they said wasn't wasn't an evil thing but it it's not you don't find any examples of it in the Bible but they were saying going to in this city and you plot out you look at your map and you plot out all the the particular centers where um, Satan's influence is noticeable and you map that out and then you pray into those kinds of things and you know what I'm I'm just not there anymore if you know what I mean I, I used to be right into it and I even got maps out and I started doing that but like I said there's no example of that in scripture ever you don't ever see Paul instructing people to map out their city and then you know, whatever. And I'm not saying that it's bad to pray um, in those kinds of ways. But in terms of what Scripture tells us about spiritual warfare, um, this is a really significant chunk of Scripture that talks about it. So what does he say? He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. One thing that I, th I think is really important when we're thinking about spiritual warfare, this is saying that we need to take our stand against the devil's schemes or Satan's schemes, it's got different different names. Have uh, we need to be asking what is the what asking the question what are the devil's schemes? If we're gonna put on armor to fight against the devil's schemes, what are those schemes? And if you just think logically through it, we know and there's plenty of scriptural examples of each of these ones that I'm gonna run through now. But this is how Satan works internally. This is how he gets uh, a hold on us in different ways uh, into, in our thinking. He uses doubt. We see that in the Garden of Eden. He uses shame. Um, again, it was shame that hid Adam and Eve from God after they'd listened to that voice of doubt. They felt shame. They said that. We were ashamed. Um, and, and they hid. 
pride and arrogance. Um, pride is definitely how Satan wants to get in. Why? Well, it's how he ended up where he is. Pride, that arrogance, that ambition to be better. Um, unforgiveness is a massive way that stirs up um, anger and a, a desire for revenge, bitterness. Um, that's all Satan's playground. Um, envy. Envy is huge. Uh, in James it tells us specifically that envy is demonic. Um, so if you're letting envious thoughts of, ooh, that person, they've got that position, I wish I had that, or, you know, there's that, it's kind of, there's a bitterness in that envy of, I, I wanted that, why haven't I got that, and or, why, why are they there, I wish I was there, or, you know, it's demonic. You don't want that. Um, but this is how Satan works. Fear of, is an obvious one where Satan tries to grab hold of us through fear and that restrains us, that holds us back from stepping into everything that God has because we're afraid of whatever. Um, despair is another way that Satan wants to take us down. It's where if you've lost all sense of hope, then your soul becomes flaccid and you just let like, and it's very hard to move forward in the purposes of God in your life if you feel despair. Now there would be a number of other things that Satan uses as well, but I just grabbed those as as main examples of the devil's schemes. So when he said to you know, he said put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The armor of God then or our spiritual warfare is what works against those aspects that are internal. If our spiritual warfare just gets so focused on out there, the devil's schemes is actually to get in our head. It's not just the out there, it's in our head that he'll plant thoughts in there that bring up all of these issues that I just mentioned. So then when he goes in to explain the full armour of God, and so this is what he says, verse 13 to 18, he says this, Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Now, if we get too focused on, um, you know, what does each piece of armor you know, why is it a helmet of salvation? Is it guarding the mind? Or the breastplate of righteousness? Is that guarding your heart and the belt of truth? I don't think Paul was in, was intending on specifically targeting, you know, different parts of the human experience. Um, one reason why I think that is because in an earlier book that Paul wrote, um, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he actually does his first little glimpse of the armor of God. He, he says, he uses the term about armor and then says that the breastplate is actually faith and love. Um, and then he says that the helmet is uh, the hope of salvation, which is similar. But in this one he says that shield, the shield is faith, not the breastplate. And he doesn't even mention love in that particular thing. So I don't think we can get too nitpicky about or, or really analyze it too closely because um, it's not what he was doing. But what he was, what we can get from it is that he's saying these things keep us protected from the devil's schemes. There's truth, understanding the truthfulness of God, the truth of God's grace, the truth of our state so these are the things that protect us from the devil's schemes. We've got truth, understanding 
the truth of of God and and the truth of what He has done for us, the truth of um, our need for Him, um, the truth that Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me." Um, so, holding on to the truth of God, righteousness. You know, and there's two aspects to that. There's the, the fact that it's by grace we're made righteous in God. Um, and so we've, he's put Jesus' righteousness in terms of our position with God. But if you, if you think about it, if, if I choose not to live a righteous life, so if I'm filled with anger and revenge, lust, um, deceitfulness, all of that living will actually make space for Satan to come and um, infiltrate our minds. And, you know, he, he even says in, in chapter 4, his comment was, um, you know, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So he's, he's suggesting there that if you're living in a, in a way that isn't considered righteous, or the right way of living, then you're giving uh, Satan a foothold into your life to have influence. So then we've got the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. I used to think that meant taking the gospel of peace out, that your feet are fitted to go with the gospel. Um, but actually, um, as good as that is to do that, I actually think that it's a readiness that comes. The gospel of peace, we've, been, we've got peace with God, we've been reconciled. That means that no matter what happens in this world, we are ready, um, we're, we're ready for anything because our eternity is set and we don't have to worry about um, anything. So there's a, there's a firm, like an ability to stand firm because of the gospel of peace, the peace that we've made with God. Um, and so we can face anything. We've got faith um, as, as the shield. Faith means trust in God when we trust that He is good, when we trust that He knows what He's doing, when we trust that He's truly wise, when we trust Him in everything, then um, everything that Satan throws at us will be deflected um, because trust is, is so integral to the quality of a relationship um, that we're protected in that. Um, salvation understanding we're saved by grace you know and, and it's not by our own efforts if he's if Satan one of his schemes is to bring pride then if we forget that we're saved by grace we can start thinking oh yeah my efforts to being uh, really good is making God impressed and I'm more impressive than other people and then ambition of oh, I could be better than this person if I just read my Bible more and do this and that and whatever and that spiritual pride Remembering salvation is that we're saved by grace. It's got nothing to do with how good we are. He loves us. He loves us now. Um, that can protect from those schemes of, of, of Satan. I've been reading um, C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, if you haven't, if you don't know anything about that. C.S. Lewis was the writer of the Narnia Chronicles. That's what he's probably most well known for. An amazing writer considered one of the greatest thinkers and theologians of the 20th century but he writes this book about a fictional book from the point of view of a, an older demon writing to a younger nephew demon and he's giving instructions on how to um, make headway with what he calls his patient which is this person who became a Christian and he's trying to undermine God's goodness um, and so Screwtape is writing to his, his nephew Wormwood um, and giving him those instructions. But one thing that, that he um, said is about um, always trying to not be noticed in what he's doing. Because as soon as the patient becomes aware of the enemy's tactics, then, um, then he can deal with it. So when we're aware that Satan wants to come with these schemes and we choose to armor ourselves up with the understanding of truth when we're living righteously, when we're 
when we're really settled in this, um, in the peace knowing that we have an eternal security, that nothing that comes will ever take that away, when we really trust God fully, when we're understanding afresh that we're saved by grace alone, that we're loved, we loved, we loved, um, it's, it's good that's going to protect us from Satan's enemies, uh, uh, Satan's tactics. The two last things are the only offensive weapons that are mentioned. Um, we've got where he says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So interestingly, uh, some may know um, from previous teachings from people that there's the word that we have in English for word. In Greek, there's logos and rhema. Logos has been... I guess, um, uh, taught to us that it means written word and rhema means spoken word. It's probably a little simplified. Not that I'm um, a super, I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm just reading from other people who explain it a little more deeply. And for me, I'm learning that logos doesn't just mean written word. It actually means message. There's times where um, logos is translated in our English Bibles as being message whereas rhema is spoken. So, interestingly, in this passage, I always approach this thinking that the sword of the Spirit is reading the Bible. But it's actually the spoken word of God. It's the proclamation of God. It's, it's that um, it's speaking life into places of death, speaking light into places of darkness. That's the weapon, the sword of the Spirit. It's when you're moved by the Spirit. Um, you, you're prompted by the Spirit and you speak um, these words of life over people, over circumstances, whatever it is. That's an offensive weapon that um, fights back against Satan's schemes and what he's wanting to do. Um, Prayer as well. It says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Again, it's this pray in the Spirit. It's like you're immersed in the person of the Holy Spirit. You're listening. You're, you're being prompted to pray in certain ways and you're moving in the power of the Spirit. It also includes, though, um, that idea of speaking in tongues, which is a strange phenomenon that maybe you're not familiar with. Or well, maybe you are, maybe you speak in tongues yourself, or maybe you don't, maybe you question it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those, I guess, more controversial kind of thoughts or topics. Uh, for me, um, I never understood it really growing up, and I didn't understand it. I now, I do speak in tongues. The circumstances that brought that about were really fascinating, and, and it quite, quite, quite different. <laughs> to Danielle's circumstances on how she started speaking for, for her. Someone else was wanting the gift of tongues, which is this language that that isn't recognized. You don't, it, with your intellect, you can't understand the words that are being spoken, but it just flows out. And it's like this language, Paul speaks about it in 1 Corinthians um, 12, but in 14, he really goes into it as being something that he, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. He actually celebrated the, the fact that he would speak in tongues. Um, but in the context of a church situation, he's saying, I'd prefer you to speak intelligible words for people to understand rather than a thousand words in tongues because people won't necessarily understand that unless there's the gift of interpretation, which is a fascinating gift as well. Um, anyway, Danny, when she, um, she was at a camp, and someone wanted the gift of, of tongues. Denny was up the front to get prayer as well, but that was for something different. And some of the people praying invited her to come and pray for this person. And as soon as she put her hand on the back, all of a sudden this language just started flowing out of her um, that she'd never spoken before. And it just burst out of her. It was this, And she wasn't even asking for anything. It just happened, uh, which is amazing. Um, mine was different. I'll, I'll maybe talk about that some other time. But... Um, Prayer in the Spirit is being immersed, it's being led, it's being prompted, but it's also this empowered by the Spirit too. There can be this prayer language, this language that you don't know intellectually 
what's being said. But you can, as Paul says, when he prays in tongues, his mind can be unfruitful, but he chooses to make his mind fruitful. So he's thinking thoughts while he's speaking in tongues. And there's some strange and, and mysterious benefit from speaking this language that is just a flow out of the Spirit. And that is a weapon um, against the work of the enemy. So to finish up, here's just the things to think about. Um, you know, all of those, all of those things are it, it, what Paul's trying to say is be alert, and he said that in it. Be alert. He concluded it by saying, "Be alert." We need to be aware that Satan wants to undermine the goodness of God, and so he will throw thoughts into your mind. Um, and it could be that influences, uh, uh, things around you happen, that then Satan jumps on and says, "Yes, think this about that." feel shame or feel fear or get envious or you know be arrogant and all of that kind of stuff and you don't hear those words but those thoughts stop you know playing around and if you entertain them it gives Satan more space to undermine what God wants to do in your life and so the best way to be in spiritual warfare in my mind is this first of all be alert Second of all, live in your calling. You've been called into the goodness of God. Live in it. Live in that space where, you know, meditate on the realities of what God has done for you. And then live out love. Live out your calling, as he tells us in, in chapter 4, where he said, live a life worthy of the calling you've received. And as you do that, you're actually undermining the, the attempts of the enemy to get in and destroy you, destroy your relationships, with God, your relationship with God, your relationships with the people around you, that's what he's all about. But if you are alert to that, that that's what he's trying to do with all of those things, the, the, um, the doubt, the shame, the pride, the unforgiveness, the envy, the fear, the, de the despair, if you're aware that that's what he's trying to do and you choose to meditate on what God has done for you and you choose to live out... Um, love, live out your calling, then you are going to completely fight against the work of the enemy. And then speaking the word of God, speaking uh, life into spaces, speaking light into darkness, into people's lives, bringing that encouragement, bringing that strength um, and praying, that's, that's how we do warfare. And according to scripture, that's what we're told. That's what Paul um, instructs us to do. And so I'm going to finish up there. Obviously, I'm going to pray. Um, if you don't know Jesus, if you're listening to this and you've never actually made a decision to say, yes, Jesus, I surrender to you. I want to have you in my life. Um, then today is the day to do that. Because the reality is, whether we like the thought or not, Scripture tells us that Satan is at work in our hearts. He is really trying to keep you from God. But maybe today is the moment that you are recognizing that actually God is putting his hand out to you and saying, Here, I'm offering you life. Come, I will rescue. I'll take you out of this dominion of darkness, bring you into my kingdom of light. That's what he's constantly saying to you. And maybe today you're becoming aware of that. And I say take his hand. Take the hand of God who can bring you out of the, um, the dominion of darkness, as, as scripture calls it, and into the kingdom of the son that he loves. That's what it says in Colossians. God wants you in his family. And so today might be the day for that to begin in your life. And so if it is, you can say this. You can say, Jesus, take me out of the dominion of darkness. I want to be brought into your kingdom. I want to be in your family. Thank you for what you did on the cross in dying for my sin so that I could be forgiven. I realize that I need you. And Holy Spirit, fill my life. Transform my life. 
change the way I think, change the way I live so that I can walk according to your ways. And if you said something along those lines, then that's just the best. Your life is going to change forever, which is amazing. But for the rest of us, I'm just going to pray that that we are um, alert and that we fight in this, this battle against spiritual forces of darkness that are coming to destroy us. Um, it's something that we don't have to be afraid of. It's something that we just have to rest in what Jesus has done and live according to that while being alert of the thought, the thoughts that might come into our mind. So Jesus, we thank you for what your scripture tells us about how we are to live. Thank you that you tell us that we are to be alert. Help us to be alert when thoughts come into our minds that are not um, of your kingdom. Uh, help us to recognize where they're coming from so that we can then stop and rest, think about what it is that you've done for us, call on you, so that we can live out uh, the thought processes that are in line with your kingdom and live out uh, the righteousness and the truth and the, the faith and all of those amazing things. We want to live that out. Help us to be aware of the enemy's tactics and help us to live out uh, your goodness. Thank you that we don't have to be afraid at all but we can rest in your goodness. Help us to pray. Help us to speak life into situations, into people's lives, so that uh, light can pierce that darkness. So we thank you, Jesus. You're amazing. Amen.